is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll further the conversation on the destruction of the Jackson Demonstration State Forest in Northern California with Chairman Michael Hunter of the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo. And then we'll switch gears and speak to Tufts University researcher, writer, and senior advisor for the Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy, Mr. Timothy A. Wise, and his latest article in the Interpress Service News entitled Magical Thinking on Fertilizer and Climate Change. But first, the news. I'm Eileen Alfandiri with KPFA News Headlines. The warning by a United Nations official that the COP26 climate summit could amount to an elephant giving birth to a mouse appears to be coming true. A draft of the document that will emerge from the summit has been watered down. It backs away from a call to end all use of coal and phase out fossil fuel subsidies completely. The latest draft calls on countries to accelerate the phase out of unabated coal power and of inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. On the question of finance, the latest draft expresses deep regret that the rich nations didn't comply with their promises of $100 billion a year in aid to poor nations to cope with the effects of global warming. It calls on rich nations to urgently scale up aid, but contains no guarantees. Climate justice activists marched in San Francisco as the climate summit is nearing a close. They were demanding an immediate end to fossil fuel extraction. Stuart Blackwell filed this report. COP26. Survival. Or. Blah, blah, blah. Several hundred climate change activists gathered outside of the Ferry Building in San Francisco to demand that leaders take emergency climate action at COP26. Nayeli Maxson Valaquez, an environmental activist, she brought her two children, Maxson, age seven, and Lincoln, age five. When I come to events like this and I bring them to events like this, I feel less depressed and more connected to people who are organizing on the systems level, not just people who are, you know, talking about what types of things they can purchase as an individual, or, but about like systems level changes that we need to collectively demand. Protesters say more promises by wealthy world leaders, even if actually acted on, will be too little, too late. I'm Stuart Blackwell for Climate Countdown on KPFA. A federal appeals court temporarily has blocked the release of Trump-era White House records to the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. The appeals court ruling effectively bars until the end of the month the release of records that were to be turned over today. The appeals court said oral arguments in the case for November 30th. The case is likely to end up at the U.S. Supreme Court. Newly released audio shows for Former President Trump defended the insurrectionists who broke into the Capitol and chanted, Hang Mike Pence. ABC correspondent Jonathan Carl interviewed Trump for his new book, quote, Betrayal, the final act of the Trump show. Carl asked Trump whether he was concerned for Pence's safety. He were you worried about him during that, that siege? Were you worried about no, his safety? No, I thought he was well protected, and I, I had heard that he was in good shape. Mm -hmm. No, because... Uh, I had heard it was in very good shape, but but no. You I heard those chants. That was terrible. I mean, those you know the. He could have. Well, the people were very angry. They're saying hang my. Because pants. it's it's common sense, John. It's common sense that you're supposed to protect. How can you, if you know a vote is fraudulent, right? Yeah. How can you pass on a fraudulent vote to Congress? Trump and Pence didn't speak for days after the insurrection and after the vice president refused to halt certification of Joe Biden's presidential win. Carl conducted the interview last March. House Republican leaders continue to remain silent days after Arizona Republican Paul Gosar tweeted an animated video showing him slashing the neck of New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with a sword. The only two Republican lawmakers to denounce the video are Liz Cheney and Adam 
Kinzinger. The two are already on the outs with the rest of the Republican caucus for agreeing to serve on the House Select Committee investigating the Capitol insurrection. Cheney says Gosar should be censured for what she calls his continued indefensible activities. She also blasted House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy for a silence. Cheney called it a real symbol of McCarthy's lack of strength, the lack of leadership in the conference right now, and the extent to which McCarthy and other leaders seem to have lost their moral compass. McCarthy has also failed to condemn the death threats received by the 13 House Republicans who voted with most Democrats to pass the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. In one voicemail, a caller labeled Republican Fred Upton a traitor and wished death for the Michigan Republican, his family and staff. Prosecutors and defense attorneys for Kyle Rittenhouse will return to the courthouse without the jury present today to finalize how jurors will be instructed when they get the murder case next week and begin deliberating. Closing arguments are expected on Monday. The 18-year-old told the jury he was defending himself when he used his rifle to kill two men and wound a third on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin in the summer of 2020. The bloodshed took place during a night of tumultuous protests after a police officer shot Jacob Blake in the back seven times, leaving him with a permanent spinal cord injury. An attorney for one of three white men standing trial for fatally shooting black jogger Ahmad Arbery in Georgia says he doesn't want any more black pastors in the courtroom. The attorney made the comment to the trial judge a day after the Reverend Al Sharpton sat in the back of the courtroom with Arbery's parents. Obviously, there's only so many pastors they can have. And if their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family, trying to influence a jury in this case. The attorney represents William Roddy Bryan, who, along with father and son, Greg and Travis McMichael, is charged with murder in Arbery's death last year. The Superior Court judge said he barely noticed Sharpton in the courtroom. A court in military rule Myanmar has sentenced detained U.S. journalist Danny Fenster to 11 years in prison with hard labor. The court found him guilty on several charges, including incitement for allegedly spreading false or inflammatory information. Fenster was the managing editor of the online magazine Frontier Myanmar. The coup government has cracked down hard on press freedom. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, some early morning fog and partly cloudy skies, then sunny with highs in the upper 60s to mid 70s in Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, widespread dense morning fog, then sunny with highs in the upper 60s. I'm Eileen Alfandari, more news in 94.1 with headlines at noon, 3 and 4. Join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Michael Hunter, chair of the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo, has been leading the charge to protect the Jackson Demonstration State Force from industrialization by the state of California and destruction by the private logging industry. And if you were listening last week, you uh, definitely uh, heard the story, part of the story the legal side from a Tom Wheeler of Epic. He's one of the environmental lawyers who's been on this case from start and hopefully to finish and here to talk to me right now to cover the very important part, the very important side, very important aspect of this fight logging against logging in Jackson Demonstration State Force. Michael Hunter, chair of the Coyote Valley Band Pomo. Chairman Michael Hunter, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Happy to be here. All right. So um, from the way that I'm looking at it, correct me if I'm wrong, there's three different aspects that need to be covered in regards to this. There's the state of California side of it. Um, there's the private logging industry. And then there's a combination thereof. Um, talk to us about uh, the position of the Coyote Valley Pomo. Um, talk to us about where your tribe is coming from in regards to all of this logging that has just started happening in Jackson Demonstration State Forest. Go ahead. Right, right. You know, as a uh, the first people of this land, you know, the Jackson Demonstration State Forest is, is Pomo country. That's uh, We have 23 Pomo tribes in Lake Mendocino and Sonoma counties. And 
those Pomo tribes use those redwoods as shelter. When it's hot, you go to for shade, but we also use it for ceremony as well. We live there. Those redwoods were rooted when my people roamed those, when they were allowed to roam those woods before they were kicked out of those woods, before they privatized them, before they created to where my people could not roam those woods. So for me, it's a different, it's a different relationship. It's a connection. We believe those redwoods are our relatives. And we also believe that they know our story. I mean, those, those, the second mature growth alone, just the second mature growth, they're 150 year old. They know our stories. When I walk those trails, I could feel it. I could feel my people's energy. And when I see the redwoods that are huge, just cut down and looked at as if they are board feet. You see, Cal Fire logging, Cal Fire Forestry looks at our redwoods as board feet. Therefore, they calculate all the redwoods board feet together and say, we're going to cut this percentage and in the Jackson Demonstration State Forest, we're going to demonstrate that we can log responsibly. We could demonstrate that we are going to log responsibly. Well, if you go to my Facebook, I brought it out. I showed everybody that, the, the, that what is really happening in those redwoods, the, the destruction that is happening, the fire hazard that's being created by Cal Fire Forestry. We have to change the way we look at those redwoods. See, Cal Fire Logging wants to demonstrate that they could manage these forests by cutting 150 old redwoods. While Cal Fire State Parks, a whole different agency, recognizes, and you can go to their website, and they talk about how the redwoods, especially the, old, the second mature growth to the old growth, how they are actually there to help, help us by reducing our carbon footprint. So you have two different outlooks by the state of California. One, Cal Fire Forestry, the logging group, they, they want to cut and say, this is good for the environment. And then you have the state park saying, no, you really don't have to cut and look at our forest. And I could, if you go out to the Jackson Demonstration State Forest, it's managed by Cal Fire Forestry, one, one piece of it. And it's just horrible. It's all dry. It's all torn up. It's a fire hazard. There's, and, it's, and it's just right there in your face. And then you can walk across the street where it's managed by the state parks and you can walk without your shoes on. That's the difference. But we have to figure out a way to change the thinking, the connection to these redwoods. We have to think in the future. And it's our older growth that it actually have more, they, they re, just reduce our carbon footprint way more than a younger tree would, a redwood tree would. So what Coyote Valley has been doing is organizing the tribes. We order not organize the United Poma Nation Council, which is 16 tribes in our area. We, we, we got a letter of support from the Central California Tribal Chairpersons Association, which is 54 tribes. And then we got the California Tribal Chairpersons Association to sign on, which is all the region of the tribal chairpersons. And we had a meeting with Secretary Crowfoot. He's the secretary for the California Natural Resources Agency. And I thought if I showed him the destruction, if I could show him what's happening in these forests and bring all the tribal leaders there to let him know we had that we were behind him because we, we believed in him, to be honest. And he wouldn't join us. And like I said, I videoed that. It's on Facebook. I showed it. He wouldn't join us. Wow. I had to ask him. You're right. And he says, you know, you're looking at, you have to look at the big picture, he tells me. And I'm sitting here saying, wait, if we cannot agree that cutting 150 old redwoods is not fire prevention, then how can we even start to negotiate, start to even have tribal consultations with you? We can't even agree on that. And he, what I realized was he didn't know. And when I looked up his resume, he graduated in political science. And I was baffled because I would not hire an environmental studies person to be my chief financial officer. 
just like I wouldn't hire my chief of financial officer to be my environmental studies. I most definitely wouldn't hire a political science major to be running the most important issue we have in California. Just not qualified. So after I recognized he's not qualified and it just came to pretty much almost all the tribes standing there, we realized that now all you want to do is talk to us, but you already have your mind made up because you're not educated on the issue. We don't have time. The environment doesn't have time. The Jackson Demonstration State Forest doesn't have time for us to educate the number one person involved in regulating our forest and our waters. We, we must demand more. We must demand that you have to graduate environmental studies of some sort to be able to lead such an agency. We have to expect more from our government. And what we're trying to do is bring awareness to it, organize and get people out there to see what's going on in our forest. And what we're asking for is a moratorium, a moratorium of logging in the Jackson Demonstration State Forest. And Secretary Wade Crowfoot has this authority because it's happened already. They stopped it in June. And then after the recall, they restarted. So someone made the call for it to stop. We need to make sure we get the local communities together, the agencies, and the tribes together to say what is best for our forest. Because what is happening right now, the destruction, the fire hazard that's being there, that is that is happening today, every day there's redwoods cut. We have to figure out a way to stop, regroup, and renegotiate to say, hey, how do we look at these forests? If you want to look at them as bored feet, then we're never going to get ahead in the environment. But if you start to look at them as state parks does, which is to reduce our carbon footprint, and the larger and the bigger and the older those trees are, the, the, the more carbon they reduce, then we have a chance to really change how we look at our forest. Our forest, is it's those redwoods that help us. It's going to help our, for our grandchildren. But if we cut the old redwoods, all, all we have is the young redwoods. And they cannot do the, they cannot reduce the carbon footprint the same as our older growth. So we have to change the mentality, the way our state thinks. But it's hard to change that when you have an unqualified secretary there that doesn't understand the environment. It's just really hard. And beyond that, what's saddening for, you know, my mother walks those forests and she cries. And I never understood why she cries, to be honest, when I was younger and growing up. And now that I'm out there in those redwoods and walking with her and I go well out there, I go a lot out there by myself and I think, and I could really relate to my people and I know that they know our stories and now it breaks my heart and I find myself crying out there and I don't understand why other people don't, don't feel the same. I don't understand people could just get a chainsaw and cut such an old redwood down and think that it's okay and think that it's uh this is how we support our family. What I've been saying is there's a way to do this together. We're not saying that the loggers should not log. We're saying that the loggers should clean up those forests, cut down, cut all the old trees that they already left on the ground and take those out. Now that's fire prevention. Take out all the old debris. Yes, go to work. We want you to work. We just don't want you to work cutting down our redwoods because we need them. We want you to work cutting down the old trees that you left, the destruction you left, and pulling those out. And then your family will get paid. We'll, we'll have a chance to save our environment, to save our forest, and hopefully a better future for all of our children, especially in this community. It's a fire hazard. It's really a shame. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, and that is the voice of Chairman Michael Hunter. He is the chair of the Coyote Valley Band Pomo up there, up north and um, in Northern California. Now, so you've been able to have a conversation with Secretary Crowfoot. And who was able yeah. to put the moratorium in the first place and then take that moratorium off who was it him did he go ahead and say hey let's put a moratorium on this or was it someone else in his administration or in the newsom administration go ahead well they didn't say moratorium literally i don't know what words were said but they stopped mm -hmm. and they waited to restart 
So that tells me that you can stop and regroup. Now, what we're asking for is a moratorium because it's more of an official and then it's an official statement. So if we get that moratorium, then we could put um, rules of engagement, how we're going to sit down, how the communities are come together and redraft what, what we believe um, these forests should be. See, right now they want to demonstrate, Cal Fire Forestry wants to demonstrate that we could cut these redwoods, 150-year-old redwoods, responsibly. We want to demonstrate that we could coexist and still log these redwoods. And like I said, you can go to my Facebook, all the videos and pictures are there. They cannot. They've proven the, the actual opposite. So we have to change. What we would like to see is Cal Fire Forestry no longer manage our state forest. Put it in, Cal, in, in California state parks. See, that's how easy it is. It's a state forest already. The governor and secretary Wade Crowfoot have those authorities to say, you know what, we're taking it out from Cal Fire Forestry and we're just going to put it in state parks. It's that easy. It's a stroke of a pen. And I told him that. I showed him that. And instead of asking me and asking the tribes, where are those areas that you show so I can investigate? This isn't okay. He said, you, that's just small areas of the forest, little areas. You got to look at the bigger picture. And in my mind, I'm like, bro, if you're not out there looking at what the damages are, and if I bring the damages to you and show you, and all you want to tell me is to not believe my own eyes and that I have to look at the bigger picture, that tells me you're not even looking at the picture that's on the wall because I just showed you what's happening in our forest. But you know what? These city boys, man, he, he doesn't know what it's like out there. He has to get out in those woods. He, has to, he should be asking the tribal leaders to say, show me, show me what's happening. Show me the proof. Let us take him and show him the proof so we can help protect our redwoods, our sacred sites that are being damaged over and over by these roads they put in by cutting up these huge, huge redwoods. And then they, when they take them out, they just cut down all these other little trees and then just leave it behind. It's called slash and burn or something. It's nuts. But he was more interested in convincing us to not believe our own eyes. And instead of asking, you know, he's a regulatory body, the California Natural Resource Agency, the regulatory body. Instead of asking us where this is so he can see it for himself, he tells us, you're not seeing the bigger picture. And that's why I fall back on the Secretary Wade Crowfoot. He believes the CAL FIRE forestry management practices, which is by board feet. We need to change that mentality. We need somebody in that position that realizes, no, it's not about board feet. It's about saving our second mature growth. So we have old mature growth in the future for carbon sequestration for to reduce our carbon footprint. Now, explain what board feet is. What is that exactly? Let's just say 100 board feet for fun. We know it's millions. 100 board feet. Now, they say in, we're going to cut 20% of that, but we're going to plant so many other new trees to help make up for that board feet. So in the decades to come, it'll replace the percentages that we're cutting. So they have that mentality, but in that mentality, you're cutting the you're cutting the second mature growth because there's a because they're the larger the straight boards they get more board feet from them, and then they make up for it with the smaller trees and say yes, but these are going to take that place, but that's not realistic. It's not reality because you need the second mature growth to actually reduce our carbon footprint. And so when you hear these politicians talk about carbon footprint. They're not, they don't really understand what they're saying, but they, but they know they're, they're, but they know most people don't understand what they're saying either. So they continue to repeat the same words over and over. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Kind of want to talk about the private logging industry, but it kind of seems like they're, uh, they're, they're an aside to, to the bigger issue. Um, now, are there any type of laws or treaties that the, the grouping of the Pomo tribes up there in Coyote Valley um, that they can can use to assist them legally in, in reclaiming the land since uh, this regulatory body, the Natural Resource, California State uh, Natural Resources Department, isn't doing anything. Is there anything that your tribes or the grouping of tribes, uh, the Pomo tribes can do to enforce it legally? Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put a legal game plan together a political game plan together, a legislative game plan together. It takes a lot of time and energy, a lot of effort, and a lot of resources. And um, right now, 
we have protesters that pretty much hold the logging the, the logging companies off until we can figure out this solution. And that's, that's why we're calling for a moratorium. That's why so many tribes put together letters to the secretary and to Cal Fire Forestry asking for a moratorium because it's a complex issue. We all have to get to the table and work this out together. Right now, Cal Fire Forestry approves these timber harvest plans. And these timber harvest plans get bidded out by these logging companies. And it's those dollars that, that actually the logging companies pay toward to Cal Fire Forestry to help subsidize their budget. So it's a conflict of interest. The more redwood trees you cut, logging companies, the more I get for my budget. It's just backwards. It's really backwards. And us as tribe, we're trying to take the lead because we have special relationships as government to government to talk directly to agencies. But when you're talking to Cal Fire Forestry, why would they agree with the tribes? They get their budget subsidized by the logging of this. So the more you log, the more they get to hire. It's, it's just backwards. So we need the, and I keep harping on this, the Secretary Wade, Crave, Wade Crowfoot to step up and call for a moratorium so we could all come together and resolve this complex issue. The Jackson Demonstration State Forest is two-thirds, I believe, of our state forest. So people want to think, or Wade Crowfoot wants you to believe that it's just a small portion. These are small portions. No, no. This is two-thirds of our state forest. We're not talking about private lands. We're talking about our state forest that exists now. We have to change the way we view that our state forest. How we, instead of demonstrating how to log, we need to demonstrate how to create a healthy environment so, so we could utilize our forest to how, actually help reduce our carbon footprint okay okay uh, yeah i just i don't understand i mean this is a huge huge issue and, and it's growing day by day i'd say even hour by hour i don't understand how i, I mean i understand that these bureaucrats they have a lot on their plate you know they're taking about care of a whole state i mean the state of california is huge it's the sixth largest contributor to the world economy you know that's understood but i don't understand how he could not be out there um looking at and seeing and witnessing himself where and how this is an issue that needs to be dealt with and dealt with yesterday um now you've got the frontline folks that are out there um protesting um what 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 can listeners do um it seems to me that that all that needs to happen is that folks that are listening to this right now need to go ahead and go out to Jackson Demonstration State Forest. What else can they do? Yeah, you got to get out there, see it for yourself. And once you fall in love with that forest, you'll find so many things that you can do more and more. But if there's one thing you could do from your home, it's contact Secretary Wade Crowfoot of the California Natural Resources Agency, demanding a moratorium. The key word is a moratorium of logging in the Jackson Demonstration State Forest until the communities come together and come up with a solution that actually the community can live with. And there's, a, there's another portion of this. So we have our local Senator McGuire, our local Assemblyman Wood, our Congressman Huffman. We've sent them the same letters from, the, from Coyote Valley, from the Pomo Council, from Central California tribes, California tribes, and they still have not responded. Senator McGuire still hasn't even emailed back. He won't even contact us regarding this issue, but yet we are in contact for other issues. It's really weird. How is, the, how is this leader of our community not coming out there? I went out to those woods. I took the videos, took the pictures, sent them to him, showed him, and he doesn't even ask me where. That blows my mind. This is his community. It's his backyard, right? But then I went to a fundraiser for, for McGuire, and Cal Fire had the biggest they're the biggest sponsor. They had the biggest table sitting right next to me. And I recognized, well, that's why you surrounded yourself with a circle of Cal Fire people while I'm surrounding myself with a certain circle of environmental leaders. That's the difference. You have to get outside your circle. Huffman has yet to reply back. He's our congressman. He should be here help leading. Wood did send me an email back saying no more future timber harvest plans, which is big. At least that's a step. But what do you do 
about the existing timber harvest plans that plan on cutting 200 year old redwoods right now, right now. And they plan on doing it before March. So we have to get this moratorium. The longer we wait, the more redwoods are cut every day. And this, this isn't just a, you know, you know, a redwood that you see, you know, skinny redwood you see, which I love them too, but this isn't those. These are the ones where it takes three, four people to, to hug, to get around the redwood. That's these ones that we're really, really worried about right now. And I don't think our local leaders really understand what's going on in their backyards. But if you want to go even further than contacting Secretary Wade Crowfoot, contact Senator McGuire and tell him we need a moratorium. Contact Assemblyman Wood, tell him, and contact Congressman Huffman. And at the very least, tell them to go out into those woods with the tribes so we could show them what they're doing to our relatives, what they're doing to our sacred sites. Because right now, I don't think they're pro-Native at all. Now, you have all this information on your Facebook page. Uh, How can folks uh, find that Facebook page where they can get the information? Yeah, Michael Hunter. Just look up Michael Hunter. You might want to type in Coyote Valley Tribal Chairman. I don't know if that's in there, but it's a picture of me and my mother. And you'll see my mother, a beautiful woman, Pomo woman. And she has, she has some really good native necklaces on. And you could tell we might just be native. And that's the one when you click and add a friend. <laughs> We'd love to be your friend. <laughs> Most definitely, <laughs> folks. Go to Facebook, Michael Hunter, chair of the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo. And you should be able to get the information there. I will be putting it on a Root Awakening of Facebook page as well. Wow, this is just, uh, it's its devastating, but um, it's not something that cannot be solved. We all need to get involved. Chairman Michael Hunter, is there anything else you'd like to say to close us out? Go ahead. Uh, just come home. That's why I try to tell the Native people, come home. These forests are your home. The reservations are just a place they put us. But you get out to those forests, you get out to those oceans, and you connect with our environment. And that's who we are. We're we're the stewards of this land. So I I like to think that everybody, whether you're native or not, can come to these areas and really connect with our environment and our redwoods and our ocean and our forest and really find yourself because there's a lot, a lot of powerful energy out there from my people. Like I said, those are our relatives and those redwoods know our stories. So if you really want to know what we're about, you go out those, those forests. They'll tell you. You'll feel it. Most definitely. And hey, we're all indigenous to somewhere. We all came from a forest from yes. somewhere. We all got to keep yeah. that in mind. I tell people, we all wore feathers before we wore jeans. We all wore leather before we wore jeans. We are, we are connected with this earth, but we have to figure out a way to reconnect. Because right now, the way our policy, our legislative, even our legislative leaders think, it's just not making sense. And you can see it in the fires in California. People have to wake up. There's a reason you have fires everywhere. It's because our forests are being mismanaged. Well, there you have it. That is the voice of Michael Hunter, chair of the Coyote Valley Band POMO. Chair of the Coyote Valley Band POMO. Check it out, Facebook. And uh, like I said, it'll be on my Facebook page as well for A Rude Awakening. Chairman Michael Hunter, thank you so, so much for taking the time to be on A Rude Awakening and and giving us this story. And uh, look forward to speaking with you in the very near future. We're going to need some updates, okay? You got it. And thank you for the good work you do, my friend. Thank you. Climate, stupid agriculture. That is how African farmers label agricultural schemes. Big ag tries to push off on them. Climate, stupid agriculture. Writer and Tufts University researcher Timothy A. Wise's latest article for Interpress Service News entitled Magical Thinking on Fertilizer and Climate Change talks about it. And of course, Bill Gates. Let's take a listen. Well, the... The, what prompted me to write the article was that um, researchers um, commissioned by uh, Grain, Greenpeace, and the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy um, did a, a new and groundbreaking life cycle analysis of the climate um, 
the climate implications of using nitrogen fertilizers, one of the main fertilizers used um, in in the United States and around the world. Um, they are um, known to be potent greenhouse gas emitters um, because the uh, nitrous oxide that comes from the um, the field use of the fertilizers, which is which are generally over applied and so not fully taken up by the plants that they're supposed to be nourishing, um, the the gas is 265 times more potent than than carbon dioxide um, and is persistent in the atmosphere. It lasts more than 100 years. So it's a very damaging um, greenhouse gas. Um, and what they set out to do was try to do the first real um, life cycle analysis of all of the different contributions of the uh, nitrogen fertilizer supply chain um, uh, to in terms of greenhouse gases. And what they found is uh, alarming. It's uh, the, their estimates are about 20% higher than um, what uh, what the uh, climate change experts had been assuming. Um, about a third, a little more than a third of those emissions come from the manufacture and transportation of those fertilizers. Um, but the field emissions, um, they they did a much deeper dive on different sources of information about about the emissions from use in the fields and found that they were indeed um, at alarming levels. Um, why are they going or leaning towards artificial endeavors to get nitrogen rich fertilizer? That part I don't understand. I mean, there's plenty plenty of fish in the sea, right? Well, yes and no. I mean the. Mm -hmm. um, the main source of nitrogen that has sustained civilizations over millennia um, is manure um, from animals and in and, and different times from humans as well, which can be very rich um, when used appropriately as a, uh, on agricultural lands. Um, the, the, the great separation of animal agriculture from crop agriculture, which was um, one of the um, supposed innovations of industrializing our agricultural systems in the U.S. and elsewhere, means that that manure is produced much more in big feedlots and in factory farms, not on fields um, where where animals are grazing, and. Um, you know, Wendell Berry, uh, the the poet and and writer, famously said that separating animals from the from crop agriculture um, took an elegant solution and separated it into two insoluble problems. Um, <laughs> one problem being you have concentrations of manure and nowhere to put them, and that is a pollutant in and of itself. And then you have land that isn't adequately fertilized. And you need fertilizer for that land if crops are going to grow. Um, the what's what's elegant for agribusiness about that solution, though, is that it's more things they can sell and more things they can produce, like synthetic fertilizer. And the huge demands for synthetic fertilizer go with the uh, expansion of industrial scale agriculture around the world. Now. Africa is not a large fertilizer user. And again, folks, speaking with Timothy A. Wise, he's a researcher and writer, and he's the author of the latest uh, piece entitled Magical Thinking on Fertilizer and Climate Change. Uh, this is his latest article for IPS News, Interpress Service News. And uh, going into how dangerous um, nitrogen fertilizer, nitrogen rich fertilizer is, how um, agra, Bill Gates's foundation that he set up specifically for the African continent um, so that he can decimate it with his techno fixes um, to hunger, <laughs> which is all BS. Um, and now he's, uh, he's, he's put, taking it that next step further after this last uh, global conference, I guess he had, uh, or African conference that he had for Agra, through Agra, what have you. Uh, he started talking about fertilizer. And uh, but Africa is not a large fertilizer user. Explain that part to us. Um, why is Africa not a large fertilizer user? Timothy A. Wise, go ahead. Well, Africa's been um, 
sort of lagged behind in the in industrial development and in industrialized agricultural development. So agriculture is less industrialized and therefore less um, uh, produced on smaller scale farms. Most food is produced on smaller scale farms. Um, most producers don't have access to or use um modern so-called modern inputs commercial inputs like synthetic fertilizer and uh, commercial seeds and pesticides and so the um gates and the alliance for green his alliance for a green revolution in africa um which is supported by not just gates but the rockefeller foundation usaid and other bilateral donors um, since 2006 has been on a campaign to change all that and help African agriculture industrialize. And key to that is getting them, getting farmers to adopt um, commercial seeds and, and synthetic fertilizers. Um, and, you know, to listen to Bill Gates in his climate book, he literally says he thinks Nitrogen fertilizer is magical. That's where I got that title for the, for the piece in IPS. And he says, he basically says that there's no way to grow food in abundance without that fertilizer, which is just just not true. But the so the goal of Agra is to uh, the increase food production by increasing the uptake of these inputs. My research has shown that that's not working. It's not significantly increasing food production. It's not producing the kinds of productivity gains that are promised. It's not reducing hunger. Hunger has grown up 50%. But this, um, uh, but this initiative um, and the commitment, ongoing commitment to getting uh, African farmers to use more fertilizer continues um, despite like I said, limited results. And now thinking about the climate impacts, Bill Gates dismisses those climate impacts as kind of a necessary evil for the greater good of food security. But it's not producing food security and the cost of that um, uh, of that path is, I think this new report is... Um, shows just how how dangerous that path could be for Africa. Yeah, and for folks out there who can uh who have the time and can take the time to uh, maybe skim through or read uh Bill Gates's book it's entitled How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Um for those of you who have been on the front lines of this climate crisis trying to make a difference, trying to save the world, probably don't need to read it, but um I want to take us to some of these some of these figures here, you know, because the numbers don't lie, Timothy A. Wise, and you are constantly ensconced and pulling the numbers out. According to the new fertilizer research, Agra is taking Africa in the wrong direction globally. The use of nitrogen fertilizer is projected to grow between 50% and 138% by 2050. Africa is projected to see at least 300, a 300% increase in the next 30 years. It will be far greater if Gates has his way. The climate implications of that development path are worrisome. A 300% increase means 2.7 million tons more of nitrogen fertilizer in Africa, with field emissions estimated at 2.65 tons of greenhouse gas emissions per ton of nitrogen and another 4.35 tons from production and transportation. Total emissions are more like seven tons of greenhouse gas per ton of nitrogen fertilizer. Wow. And there's more. By 2050, a 300% increase in Africa's fertilizer use would mean adding about 19 million tons of GHGs per year, more than it emits now. And folks, you just need to go to this article. It is insanely scary. Magical thinking on fertilizer and climate change. Now, because these numbers are undeniable, I, I don't understand how Gates is countering any of this. 
I mean, it doesn't, how is Agra, how is his, uh, um, his green revolution, uh, his minions, his, you know, I'm, I'm sure he has people that he calls researchers. Are they refuting any of this or, or are they just ignoring it, acting like it doesn't exist? Timothy A. Wise, go ahead. Um, I, I think, I mean, what's interesting about, about Bill Gates' discussion of this topic in his book is that he really acknowledges the climate implications and basically throws up his hands and said, unfortunately, we have no alternative. And there's two things that are problematic about that. I mean, one is that it really, I mean, the reason African farmers, I think the person who first said it to me was a f farmer attending a conference in, in Mozambique um, several years ago, um, where it would hit 105 degrees outside. Everybody was talking about global warming. There was a global warming uh, climate change conference going on in nice air conditioned rooms where uh, powerful leaders talked about the things they could do to, to, to achieve climate smart agriculture, as they call it, um, and the farmers in their own non-air conditioned conference called it climate stupid agriculture because, because they basically said, why would you put a country on a path to rely on a, um, a greenhouse gas producing um, chemical and a process that is um, is dependent on a production process dependent on fossil fuels. Um, the about thirty five percent of the emissions come from the production of nitro of um, nitrogen fertilizer, and that's done with heavy use of natural gas. Um, because what it's doing is it's making ammonia by um, by uh, combining um, hydrogen, um, and the hydrogen comes from uh, from fossil fuels. So it's very fossil fuel intensive. And these farmers are saying, um, if climate change is a problem, why are you making us? Why are you recommending a path that, that makes us dependent on fossil fuels? and emits greenhouse gases. Um, the Gates um, response to it is, um, you know, what some of us might, some of us might call magical thinking, but in his mind, I think of it more as faith-based, faith-based um, uh, social engineering. Um, he has said that he's, he, he confessed in an economist interview when after his book came out that that he you know i'm kind of a one trick pony he said technology is the answer to everything and that's exactly the problem um the only answers that he can see and take seriously are technological solutions so his solution in the long run to the to the um, nitrogen fertilizer problem is genetically modified microbes and genetically modified crops crops that could could create their own nitrogen and microbes that would um, store nitrogen in the soil um, and could be genetically engineered to do that. Neither exists now. Unclear whether they're even feasible and really doubtful that many in the people in the world would, would want to use them um, because of the fears and suspicions and untested nature of a lot of the genetically modified um, products that have been marketed to developing countries, but that's the magical thinking that, and that's the only thinking he can see, and and so you're left with what he acknowledges is a climate damaging product that we just have to use because there's no other way to grow food. And again, he's just dead wrong about that. He had this dependency on him as being this savior. It's a very uh, um, patriarchal way of looking at this this situation um, as far as hunger is concerned, as far as uh, so-called undeveloped countries um, and his, his whole application, you know, to those so-called issues in Africa. It's like it's just this um, it's very tone deaf and it's extremely racist. And for for him to 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 sit on his his um, I don't know proverbial pillar, thinking that he's above it all, there is this huge 
egregious disconnect. It's insidious, actually. What is the next step to get Bill Gates and his ilk to understand that they need to keep their hands off of places like Africa? They don't want that type of help. They don't need that type of help. I mean, you know, there's this clash of developing and so-called undeveloped uh, countries, continents. You know, the global south, the global south is, is constantly being victimized, you know, robbed, raped, pillaged by big ag, by big agribusiness, by these multinational corporations that are allowed to just step in and do whatever the hell they want. What do you think as a researcher, as a writer, as as someone who has their finger on the pulse constantly about what's happening in Africa and the global south as a whole, what is the next step to try to get this, this particular idiot, Bill Gates, to understand he needs to step off and stop doing what he's doing or he's going to kill us all? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the. I think the, I mean, it's easy to get over-focused on Gates himself. Um, because he's doing so and, much, Tim. He's doing so, I mean, he's got his hands sure. in so many different pies. I, I don't, I don't think it's over-focusing. I mean, if he's doing it, we need to focus on it, right? You know what I mean? Go ahead. Ab- absolutely. It's critical. And he's, I mean, uh, I've called him the elephant in the room in African development because nobody really wants to acknowledge that he's there and that he's pulling so many of the strings. Um, um, But he really is. Um, So I'm not trying to downplay that, but the Gates Foundation is a family foundation. It had three trustees, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has since resigned. Bill and Melinda are getting divorced. It now has two trustees, Bill and Melinda. It is responsible to them and to them alone. USAID, the US Agency for International Development, has been a supporter of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa from the beginning in 2006. Um, it's put more than $100 million into the, um, into the effort. And they are in uh, supposedly responsive to public pressure and to uh, accountability for their results. And so um, a lot of uh, an alliance of groups is approaching USAID and Congress to say, stop funding this this destructive practice and shift funding into uh, into agroecological practices and more sustainable practices that actually improve food security and sustainability at the same time. That, so I, I think we there's a lot more leverage there. Um, uh, I mean, the, the thing that that um, that I keep coming back to and that I think is the kind of role a researcher and writer like me can play in all of this is to is to highlight the the absurdities of some of these uh, recommended approaches and and the existence of credible alternatives. I mean, here's the thing that's so striking about about um, the nitrogen fertilizer story for Africa is that if if Gates has his way, Afri- fertilizer use in Africa won't just go up 300 percent by um, by 2050. It would go up to current average levels in the world today. Let's say that would be an 800 percent increase in the use of these fertilizers what would that mean based on these climate implica- these climate calculations that the uh, these researchers just did in terms of the emissions i mean you read off all the tons per um, uh, greenhouse gases per ton of, of fertilizer um, that's a little mind numbing for people this isn't so mind numbing that means that in 2050 it would be um, that every year africa would be emitting greenhouse gases, the equivalent of deforesting 1.2 million acres of the Amazon rainforest every year, more than with that added use of fertilizer. And that between now and then, by increasing at the rate that they would recommend, um, we would be eliminating 17 million acres of Amazon rainforest with all the climate implications that that has. We all know how important it is to preserve rainforests. He knows how important it is to preserve rainforests. In his book, he talks about the importance of preserving rainforests as a carbon sink uh, to avoid releasing the the carbon stored in the soil and in the plants, et cetera, et cetera. With one hand, he wants to prevent deforestation and with another, 
he's promoting an agricultural development process that would put would be the equivalent between now and 2050 of deforesting 17 million acres of Amazon rainforest. That is should wake people up to the idea that this is not not the path to take. Particularly when you look at the other research I've done showing that it's not really helping with the food security problem. Yeah, well, there you have it right there. Right there, folks. That is the voice of Timothy A. Wise. And uh, Timothy A. Wise has a an article that's his latest piece entitled Magical Thinking on Fertilizer and Climate Change. And that was for IPS News Interpress Service News. And you can go to their website and check it out. And that's IPSnews.net, IPSnews.net. And uh, the latest scheme by Big Agribusiness, specifically Bill Gates's uh, Green Revolution organization there on the continent of Africa, just uh, chopping it up, literally trying to kill every kill every good thing off there. Um, Timothy A. Wise has uh, has some extensive extensive data um, from his extensive research uh, on the matter of um, fertilizer nitrogen rich fertilizer and it's not organic nitrogen rich fertilizer it's a, a bill gates concoction trying to get us all dependent on his crap uh, starting with africa this is just ugh. another conversation that has uh fully pissed me off tim <laughs> Well, it's always I, great to talk I, to you. I, I think people should be pissed <laughs> off. I mean, we're having this conversation as the climate negotiations are wrapping up in Glasgow. Yeah. And food, ha- food issues and food system issues have just not been hardly on the table. There's an agreement on methane, which could be good if it was enforced. Methane, a lot of the methane comes from agriculture, but they really only focused on uh, the methane coming from leaks in the um, natural gas production and the like not so much on agriculture. So that's a, it's a gap that, um, that food systems aren't being taken seriously in these climate negotiations, depending on the estimate. Um, they're estimated for roughly a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a huge and important set of interconnected sectors that are, um, that are contributing to this and this um, nitrogen fertilizer piece is a piece of that. I do think that the, um, I really appreciated the the researchers' work on this, and they actually deserve, in fact, to be recognized um, by name because they're not just anonymous researchers. They're Stefano Manigat um, at the University of Turin, Alicia Ledo, and Reyes Tirado of the University of Exeter are the ones who did this great research. Most definitely, most definitely. Well, a big, big, big uh, shout out to them. And you're going to have to go ahead and wrap it up. You have just been listening to Timothy A. Wise, folks. Thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Looking forward to speaking with you in the very near future. Thank you, Sabrina. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Michael Hunter and Timothy A. Wise, for taking the time. Always real Roddy Keel is on the controls. I'll be back next week, same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, folks, to embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you Chris for Hedges, this. author, war reporter, progressive minister, and prison reformer, will be with us once again in his latest book, Our class. He lays bare the grotesque inhumanity of the American penal system and the profound humanity of incarcerated men. Chris has been teaching in New Jersey prisons. A group of his drama students wrote a play of their own titled Caged. It was performed before sold out audiences. In his chronicle of how this happened, Hedges lets his students reveal their personal stories. Alice Walker writes, this book could make graspable why today's prisons are contemporary slave plantations. I couldn't put it down. Chris Hedges will be in a KPFA Zoom event on Thursday, November 18th, starting 7 p.m. Mickey Huff of Project Censored will host. For tickets, go to kpfa.org and scroll down. Please join us. The 50th annual KPFA Holiday Benefit Craft Fair is coming up at the end of November. 
Our awesome team of volunteers ensures the event runs smoothly by helping out with light duties around the fair, and we would love for you to join us. Volunteers will be asked to present proof of vaccination or negative PCR test upon arrival. Masks are required for everyone regardless of vaccination status. For more information and to sign up, go to brainwaycraftbird.com slash volunteer. listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 